Section twenty nine of the Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, Gentlemen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by L. D. Hamilton. The Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, Gentlemen, by Washington Irving. Philip of Poconoket, an Indian memoir. As monumental bronze unchanged his look, a soul that pity touched but never shook, trained from his tree-rocked cradle to his bier, the fierce extremes of good and ill to brook, impassive, fearing but the shame of fear, stoic of the woods, a man without a tear. Campbell. It is to be regretted that those early writers who treated of the discovery and settlement of America have not given us more particular and candid accounts of the remarkable characters that flourished in savage life. The scanty anecdotes which have reached us are full of peculiarity and interest. They furnish us with nearer glimpses of human nature and show what man is in a comparatively primitive state, and what he owes to civilization. There is something of the charm of discovery in lighting upon these wild and unexplored tracts of human nature, in witnessing, as it were, the native growth of moral sentiment, and perceiving those generous and romantic qualities which have been artificially cultivated by society vegetating in spontaneous hardihood and rude magnificence. In civilized life, where the happiness and indeed almost the existence of man depends so much upon the opinion of his fellow men, he is constantly acting a studied part. The bold and peculiar traits of native character are refined away or softened down by the leveling influence of what is termed good breeding, and he practices so many petty deceptions and affects so many generous sentiments for the purposes of popularity, that it is difficult to distinguish his real from his artificial character. The Indian, on the contrary, free from the restraints and refinements of polished life, and in a great degree a solitary and independent being, obeys the impulses of his inclination or the dictates of his judgment, and thus the attributes of his nature, being freely indulged, grow singly great and striking. Society is like a lawn, where every roughness is smoothed, every bramble eradicated, and where the eye is delighted by the smiling verdure of a velvet surface. He, however, who would study nature in its wildness and variety, must plunge into the forest, must explore the glen, must stem the torrent and dare the precipice. These reflections arose on casually looking through a volume of early colonial history, wherein are recorded with great bitterness, the outrages of the Indians and their wars with the settlers' New England. It is painful to perceive, even from these partial narratives, how the footsteps of civilization may be traced in the blood of the Aborigines, how easily the colonists were moved to hostility by the lust of conquest, how merciless and exterminating was their warfare. The imagination shrinks at the idea of how many intellectual beings were hunted from the earth, how many brave and noble hearts of nature's sterling coinage were broken down and trampled in the dust. Such was the fate of Philip of Poconoket, an Indian warrior whose name was once a terror throughout Massachusetts and Connecticut. He was the most distinguished of a number of contemporary sachems who reigned over the Pequods, the Narragansetts, the Wampanoags, and the other eastern tribes at the time of the first settlement of New England, a band of native untaught heroes 
who made the most generous struggle of which human nature is capable, fighting to the last gasp in the cause of their country, without a hope of victory or a thought of renown, worthy of an age of poetry and fit subjects for local story and romantic fiction, they have left scarcely any authentic traces on the page of history, but stalk like gigantic shadows in the dim twilight of tradition. While correcting the proof sheets of this article, the author is informed that a celebrated English poet has nearly finished an heroic poem on the story of Philip of Poconoket. When the pilgrims, as the Plymouth settlers are called by their descendants, first took refuge on the shores of the New World from the religious persecutions of the Old, their situation was to the last degree gloomy and disheartening. Few in number, and that number rapidly perishing away through sickness and hardships, surrounded by a howling wilderness and savage tribes, exposed to the rigors of an almost arctic winter and the vicissitudes of an ever-shifting climate their minds were filled with doleful forebodings and nothing preserved them from sinking into despondency but the strong excitement of religious enthusiasm in this forlorn situation they were visited by massasoit chief sagamore of the wampanoags a powerful chief who reigned over a great extent of country. Instead of taking advantage of the scanty number of the strangers and expelling them from his territories, into which they had intruded, he seemed at once to conceive for them a generous friendship and extended towards them the rights of primitive hospitality. He came early in the spring to their settlement of New Plymouth, attended by a mere handful of followers, entering into a solemn league of peace and amity, sold them a portion of the soil, and promised to secure for them the good will of his savage allies. Whatever may be said of Indian perfidy, it is certain that the integrity and good faith of Massasoit have never been impeached. He continued a firm and magnanimous friend of the white men suffering them to extend their possessions and to strengthen themselves in the land and betraying no jealousy of their increasing power and prosperity shortly before his death he came once more to new plymouth with his son alexander for the purpose of renewing the covenant of peace and of securing it to his posterity at this conference he endeavored to protect the religion of his forefathers from the encroaching zeal of the missionaries, and stipulated that no further attempt should be made to draw off his people from their ancient faith. But, finding the English obstinately opposed to any such condition, he mildly relinquished the demand. Almost the last act of his life was to bring his two sons, Alexander and Philip, as they had been named by the English, to the residence of a principal settler, recommending mutual kindness and confidence, and entreating that the same love and amity which had existed between the white men and himself might be continued afterwards with his children. The good old Sachem died in peace, and was happily gathered to his fathers before sorrow came upon his tribe. His children remained behind to experience the ingratitude of white men. His eldest son, Alexander, succeeded him. He was of a quick and impetuous temper, and proudly tenacious of his hereditary rights and dignity. The intrusive policy and dictatorial conduct of the strangers excited his indignation, and he beheld with uneasiness their exterminating wars with the neighboring tribes. He was doomed soon to incur their hostility, being accused of plotting with the Narragansetts to rise against the English and drive them from the land. In 
It is impossible to say whether this accusation was warranted by facts or was grounded on mere suspicions. It is evident, however, by the violent and overbearing measures of the settlers, that they had by this time begun to feel conscious of the rapid increase of their power, and to grow harsh and inconsiderate in their treatment of the natives. They dispatched an armed force to seize upon Alexander, and to bring him before their courts. He was traced to his woodland haunts, and surprised at a hunting-house, where he was reposing with a band of his followers, unarmed, after the toils of the chase. The suddenness of his arrest, and the outrage offered to his sovereign dignity, so preyed upon the irascible feelings of this proud savage as to throw him into a raging fever. He was permitted to return home, on condition of sending his son as a pledge for his reappearance. But the blow he had received was fatal, and before he reached his home, he fell a victim to the agonies of a wounded spirit. The successor of Alexander was Metamochet, or King Philip, as he was called by the settlers on account of his lofty spirit and ambitious temper. These, together with his well-known energy and enterprise, had rendered him an object of great jealousy and apprehension, and he was accused of having always cherished a secret and implacable hostility towards the whites. Such may very probably and very naturally have been the case. He considered them as originally but mere intruders into the country, who had presumed upon indulgence, and were extending an influence baneful to savage life. He saw the whole race of his countrymen melting before them from the face of the earth, their territories slipping from their hands, and their tribes becoming feeble, scattered, and dependent. It may be said that the soil was originally purchased by the settlers, but who does not know the nature of Indian purchases in the early periods of colonization? The Europeans always made thrifty bargains through their superior adroitness in traffic, and they gained vast accessions of territory by easily provoked hostilities. An uncultivated savage is never a nice inquirer into the refinements of law by which an injury may be gradually and legally inflicted. Leading facts are all by which he judges, and it was enough for Philip to know that before the intrusion of the Europeans, his countrymen were lords of the soil, and that now they were becoming vagabonds in the land of their fathers. But whatever may have been his feelings of general hostility and his particular indignation at the treatment of his brother, he suppressed them for the present, renewed the contract with the settlers, and resided peacefully for many years at Poconoket, or, as it was called by the English, Mount Hope, now Bristol, Rhode Island, the ancient seat of dominion of his tribe. Suspicions, however, which were at first but vague and indefinite, began to acquire form and substance, and he was at length charged with attempting to instigate the various eastern tribes to rise at once, and by a simultaneous effort, to throw off the yoke of their oppressors. It is difficult, at this distant period, to assign the proper credit due to these early accusations against the Indians. There was a proneness to suspicion, and an aptness to acts of violence on the part of the whites, that gave weight and importance to every idle tale. Informers abounded where tale-bearing met with countenance and reward, and the sword was readily unsheathed when its success was certain, and it carved out empire. The only positive evidence on record against Philip is the accusation of one Sossaman, a renegado Indian, whose natural cunning had been quickened by a partial education which he had received among the settlers. He changed his faith and his allegiance two or three times with a facility that evinced the looseness of his principles. 
He had acted for some time as Philip's confidential secretary and counsellor, and had enjoyed his bounty and protection. Finding, however, that the clouds of adversity were gathering round his patron, he abandoned his service and went over to the Whites, and in order to gain their favour, charged his former benefactor with plotting against their safety. A rigorous investigation took place. Philip and several of his subjects submitted to be examined, but nothing was proved against them. The settlers, however, had now gone too far to retract. They had previously determined that Philip was a dangerous neighbor. They had publicly evinced their distrust, and had done enough to ensure his hostility. According, therefore, to the usual mode of reasoning in these cases, his destruction had become necessary to their security. Sossaman, the treacherous informer, was shortly afterwards found dead in a pond, having fallen a victim to the vengeance of his tribe. Three Indians, one of whom was a friend and counsellor of Philip, were apprehended and tried, and on the testimony of one very questionable witness, were condemned and executed as murderers. The treatment of his subjects and ignominious punishment of his friend outraged the pride and exasperated the passions of Philip. The bolt which had fallen thus at his very feet awakened him to the gathering storm, and he determined to trust himself no longer in the power of the white men. The fate of his insulted and broken-hearted brother still rankled in his mind, and he had a further warning in the tragical story of Miantanamo, a great sachem of the Narragansetts, who, after manfully facing his accusers before a tribunal of the colonists, exculpating himself from a charge of conspiracy and receiving assurances of amity, had been perfidiously dispatched at their instigation. Philip, therefore, gathered his fighting men about him, persuaded all strangers that he could to join his cause, sent the women and children to the Narragansetts for safety, and wherever he appeared was continually surrounded by armed warriors. When the two parties were thus in a state of distrust and irritation, the least spark was sufficient to set them in a flame. The Indians, having weapons in their hands, grew mischievous and committed various petty depredations. In one of their maraudings, a warrior was fired on and killed by a settler. This was the signal for open hostilities. The Indians pressed to revenge the death of their comrade, and the alarm of war resounded through the Plymouth colony. In the early chronicles of these dark and melancholy times, we meet with many indications of the diseased state of the public mind. The gloom of religious abstraction and the wildness of their situation among trackless forests and savage tribes had disposed the colonists to superstitious fancies, and had filled their imaginations with the frightful chimeras of witchcraft and spectrology. There were much given also to a belief in omens. The troubles with Philip and his Indians were preceded, we are told, by a variety of those awful warnings which forerun great and public calamities. The perfect form of an Indian bow appeared in the air at New Plymouth, which was looked upon by the inhabitants as, quote, prodigious apparition, unquote. At Hadley, Northampton, and other towns in their neighborhood, quote, was heard the report of a great piece of ordnance with a shaking of the earth and a considerable echo, close quote the Reverend Increase Mather's history. Others were alarmed on a still sunshiny morning by the discharge of guns and muskets. Bullets seemed to whistle past them, and the noise of drums resounded in the air, seeming to pass away to the westward. 
Others fancied that they heard the galloping of horses over their heads. And certain monstrous births, which took place about the time, filled the superstitious in some towns with doleful forebodings. Many of these portentous sights and sounds may be ascribed to natural phenomena, to the northern lights which occur vividly in those latitudes, the meteors which explode in the air, the casual rushing of a blast through the top branches of the forest, the crash of fallen trees or disrupted rocks, and to those other uncouth sounds and echoes, which will sometimes strike the ear so strangely amidst the profound stillness of woodland's solitudes. These may have startled some melancholy imaginations, may have been exaggerated by the love for the marvelous, and listened to with that avidity with which we devour whatever is fearful and mysterious. The universal currency of these superstitious fancies and the grave record made of them by one of the learned men of the day are strongly characteristic of the times. The nature of the contest that ensued was such as too often distinguishes the warfare between civilized men and savages. On the part of the whites, it was conducted with superior skill and success, but with a wastefulness of the blood and a disregard of the natural rights of their antagonists. On the part of the Indians, it was waged with the desperation of men fearless of death, and who had nothing to expect from peace but humiliation, dependence, and decay. The events of the war are transmitted to us by a worthy clergyman of the time, who dwells with horror and indignation on every hostile act of the Indians, however justifiable, whilst he mentions with applause the most sanguinary atrocities of the whites. Philip is reviled as a murderer and a traitor, without considering that he was a true-born prince gallantly fighting at the head of his subjects to avenge the wrongs of his family, to retrieve the tottering power of his line, and to deliver his native land from the oppression of usurping strangers. The project of a wide and simultaneous revolt, if such had really been formed, was worthy of a capacious mind, and had it not been prematurely discovered, might have been overwhelming in its consequences. The war that actually broke out was but a war of detail, a mere succession of casual exploits and unconnected enterprises. Still, it sets forth the military genius and daring prowess of Philip, and wherever, in the prejudiced and passionate narrations that have been given of it, we can arrive at simple facts, we find him displaying a vigorous mind, a fertility of expedience, a contempt of suffering and hardships, and an unconquerable resolution that command our sympathy and applause. Driven from his paternal domains at Mount Hope, he threw himself into the depths of those vast and trackless forests that skirted the settlements and were almost impervious to anything but a wild beast or an Indian. Here he gathered together his forces like the storm accumulating its stores of mischief in the bosom of the thunder cloud, and would suddenly emerge at a time and place least expected, carrying havoc and dismay into the villages. There were now and then indications of these impending ravages that filled the minds of the colonists with awe and apprehension. The report of a distant gun would perhaps be heard from the solitary woodland where there was known to be no white man. The cattle which had been wandering in the woods would sometimes return home wounded, or an Indian or two would be seen lurking about the skirts of the forests and suddenly disappearing, as the lightning will sometimes be seen playing silently about the edge of the cloud that is brewing up the tempest. Though sometimes pursued and even surrounded by the settlers, yet Philip as often escaped almost miraculously from their toils, and plunging into the wilderness, 
would be lost to all search or inquiry until he again emerged at some far distant quarter, laying the country desolate. Among his strongholds were the great swamps or morasses, which extended in some parts of New England, composed of loose bogs of deep black mud, perplexed with thickets, brambles, rank weeds, the shattered and moldering trunks of fallen trees, overshadowed by lugubrious hemlocks. The uncertain footing and the tangled mazes of these shaggy wilds rendered them almost impracticable to the white man, though the Indian could tread their labyrinths with the agility of a deer. Into one of these, the great swamp of Pocasset Neck, was Philip once driven with a band of his followers. The English did not dare to pursue him, fearing to venture into these dark and frightful recesses, where they might perish in fens and miry pits, or be shot down by lurking foes. They therefore invested the entrance to the neck, and began to build a fort with the thought of starving out the foe. But Philip and his warriors wafted themselves on a raft over an arm of the sea in the dead of night, leaving the women and children behind, and escaped away to the westward, kindling the flames of war among the tribes of Massachusetts and the Nipmuc country, and threatening the colony of Connecticut. In this way, Philip became a theme of universal apprehension. The mystery in which he was enveloped exaggerated his real terrors. He was an evil that walked in darkness, whose coming none could foresee and against which none knew when to be on the alert. The whole country abounded with rumors and alarms. Philip seemed almost possessed of ubiquity, for in whatever part of the widely extended frontier and eruption from the forest took place, Philip was said to be its leader. Many superstitious notions also were circulated concerning him. He was said to deal in necromancy, and to be attended by an old Indian witch or prophetess, whom he consulted and who assisted him by her charms and incantations. This indeed was frequently the case with Indian chiefs, either through their own credulity or to act upon that of their followers, and the influence of the prophet and the dreamer over Indian superstition has been fully evidenced in recent instances of savage warfare. At the time that Philip effected his escape from Pocasset, his fortunes were in a desperate condition. His forces had been thinned by repeated fights, and he had lost almost the whole of his resources. In this time of adversity, he found a faithful friend in Canonchet, chief sachem of all the Narragansetts. He was the son and heir of Miantanamo, the great sachem, who is already mentioned, after an honorable acquittal of the charge of conspiracy, had been privately put to death at the perfidious instigations of the settlers. He was the heir, says the old chronicler, of all his father's pride and insolence, as well as of his malice towards the English. He certainly was the heir of his insults and injuries, and the legitimate avenger of his murder. Though he had forborne to take an active part in this hopeless war, Yet he received Philip and his broken forces with open arms, and gave them the most generous countenance and support. This at once drew upon him the hostility of the English, and it was determined to strike a signal blow that would involve both the sachems in one common ruin. A great force was therefore gathered together at Massachusetts, Plymouth, and Connecticut, and was sent into the Narragansett country in the depth of winter, when the swamps, being frozen and leafless, could be traversed with comparative facility, and would no longer afford dark and impenetrable fastnesses to the Indians. Apprehensive of attack, Canonchet had conveyed the greater part of his stores, together with the old, the infirm, the women and children of his tribe, 
to a strong fortress, where he and Philip had likewise drawn up the flower of their forces. This fortress, deemed by the Indians impregnable, was situated upon a rising mound or kind of island of five or six acres in the midst of a swamp. It was constructed with a degree of judgment and skill vastly superior to what is usually displayed in Indian fortification, and indicative of the martial genius of these two chieftains. Guided by renegado Indian, the English penetrated through December snows to this stronghold and came upon the garrison by surprise. The fight was fierce and tumultuous. The assailants were repulsed in their first attack, and several of their bravest officers were shot down in the act of storming the fortress sword in hand. The assault was renewed with greater success. A lodgment was effected. The Indians were driven from one post to another. They disputed their ground inch by inch, fighting with the fury of despair. Most of their veterans were cut to pieces, and after a long and bloody battle, Philip and Canonchet, with a handful of surviving warriors, retreated from the fort and took refuge in the thickets of the surrounding forest. The victors set fire to the wigwams and to the fort. The whole was soon in a blaze. Many of the old men, the women, and the children perished in the flames. This last outrage overcame even the stoicism of the savage. The neighboring woods resounded with the yells of rage and despair uttered by the fugitive warriors as they beheld the destruction of their dwellings and heard the agonizing cries of their wives and offspring. The burning of the wigwams, says a contemporary writer, the shrieks and cries of the women and children and the yelling of the warriors exhibited a most horrible and affecting scene so that it greatly moved some of the soldiers. The same writer cautiously adds, they were in much doubt then, and afterwards seriously inquired whether burning their enemies alive could be consistent with humanity and the benevolent principles of the gospel. Manuscript of the Reverend W. Ruggles The fate of the brave and generous Canonchet is worthy of particular mention. The last scene of his life is one of the noblest instances on record of Indian magnanimity. Broken down in his power and resources by this signal defeat, yet faithful to his ally and to the hapless cause which he had espoused, he rejected all overtures of peace offered on condition of betraying Philip and his followers and declared that he would fight it out to the last man rather than become a servant to the English. His home being destroyed, his country harassed and laid waste by the incursions of the conquerors, he was obliged to wander away to the banks of the Connecticut where he formed a rallying point to the whole body of western Indians and laid waste several of the English settlements. Early in the spring, he departed on a hazardous expedition with only thirty chosen men to penetrate to Seekonk in the vicinity of Mount Hope and to procure seed corn to plant for the sustenance of his troops. This little hand of adventurers had safely passed through the Pequod country and were in the center of the Narragansett, resting at some wigwams near Pawtucket River, when an alarm was given of an approaching enemy. Having but seven men by him at the time, Canonchet dispatched two of them to the top of a neighboring hill to bring intelligence of the foe. Panic-struck by the appearance of a troop of English and Indians rapidly advancing, they fled in breathless terror past their chieftain, without stopping to inform him of the danger. Canonchet sent another scout who did the same. He then sent two more, one of whom, hurrying back in confusion and affright, told him that the whole British army was at hand. Canonchet saw there was no choice but immediate flight. 
He attempted to escape round the hill, but was perceived and hotly pursued by the hostile Indians and a few of the fleetest of the English. Finding the swiftest pursuer close upon his heels, he threw off first his blanket, then his silver-laced coat and belt of pig, by which his enemies knew him to be Canonchet, and redoubled the eagerness of pursuit. At length, in dashing through the river, his foot slipped upon a stone, and he fell so deep as to wet his gun. This accident so struck him with despair that as he afterwards confessed, his heart and his bowels turned within him, and he became like a rotten stick, void of strength. To such a degree was he unnerved that, being seized by a Pequod Indian within a short distance of the river, he made no resistance, though a man of great vigor of body and boldness of heart. But on being made prisoner, the whole pride of his spirit arose within him, and from that moment we find, in the anecdotes given by his enemies, nothing but repeated flashes of elevated and prince-like heroism. Being questioned by one of the English who first came up with him, and who had not attained his twenty-second year, the proud-hearted warrior, looking with lofty contempt upon his youthful countenance, replied, You are a child. You cannot understand matters of war. Let your brother or your chief come. Him will I answer. Though repeated offers were made to him of his life, on condition of submitting with his nation to the English, yet he rejected them with disdain and refused to send any proposals of the kind to the great body of his subjects, saying that he knew none of them would comply. Being reproached with his breach of faith towards the whites, his boast that he would not deliver up a wampanoag, nor the paring of a wampanoag's nail, and his threat that he would burn the English alive in their houses, he disdained to justify himself haughtily answering that others were as forward for the war as himself, and he desired to hear no more thereof. So noble and unshaken a spirit, so true a fidelity to his cause and his friend, might have touched the feelings of the generous and the brave. But Canonchet was an Indian, a being towards whom war had no courtesy, humanity, no law, religion, no compassion. He was condemned to die. The last words of his that are recorded are worthy the greatness of his soul. When sentence of death was passed upon him, he observed that he liked it well, for he should die before his heart was soft, or he had spoken anything unworthy of himself. His enemies gave him the death of a soldier for he was shot at Stoningham by three young sachems of his own rank. The defeat at the Narragansett fortress and the death of Canon Chet were fatal blows to the fortunes of King Philip. He made an ineffectual attempt to raise a head of war by stirring up the Mohawks to take arms. But though possessed of the native talents of a statesman, his arts were counteracted by the superior arts of his enlightened enemies, and the terror of their warlike skill began to subdue the resolution of the neighboring tribes. The unfortunate chieftain saw himself daily stripped of power, and his ranks rapidly thinning around him. Some were suborned by the whites, others fell victims to the hunger and fatigue, and to the frequent attacks by which they were harassed. His stores were all captured. His chosen friends were swept away from before his eyes. His uncle was shot down by his side. His sister was carried into captivity. And in one of his narrow escapes, he was compelled to leave his beloved wife and only son to the mercy of the enemy. His ruin, says the historian, being thus gradually carried on, his misery was not prevented, but augmented thereby. 
being himself made acquainted with the sense and experimental feeling of the captivity of his children, loss of friends, slaughter of his subjects, bereavement of all family relations, and being stripped of all outward comforts before his own life should be taken away. To fill up the measure of his misfortunes, his own followers began to plot against his life, that by sacrificing him they might purchase dishonorable safety. Through treachery, a number of his faithful adherents, the subjects of Witamo, an Indian princess of Pocasset, a near kinswoman and confederate of Philip, were betrayed into the hands of the enemy. Witamo was among them at the time, and attempted to make her escape by crossing a neighboring river. Either exhausted by swimming or starved with cold and hunger, she was found dead and naked near the waterside, but persecution ceased not at the grave. Even death, the refuge of the wretched, where the wicked commonly cease from troubling, was no protection to this outcast female, whose great crime was affectionate fidelity to her kinsman and her friend. Her corpse was the object of unmanly and dastardly vengeance. The head was severed from the body and set upon a pole, and was thus exposed at Taunton to the view of her captive subjects. They immediately recognized the features of their unfortunate queen, and were so affected at this barbarous spectacle that we are told they broke forth into the most horrid and diabolical lamentations. However Philip had borne up against the complicated miseries and misfortunes that surrounded him, the treachery of his followers seemed to wring his heart and reduce him to despondency. It is said that he never rejoiced afterwards, nor had success in any of his designs. The spring of hope was broken. The ardor of enterprise was extinguished. He looked around, and all was danger and darkness. There was no eye to pity, nor any arm that could bring deliverance. With a scanty band of followers who still remained true to his desperate fortunes, the unhappy Philip wandered back to the vicinity of Mount Hope, the ancient dwelling of his fathers. Here he lurked about like a specter among the scenes of former power and prosperity now bereft of home, of family, and a friend. There needs no better picture of his destitute and piteous situation than that furnished by the homely pen of the chronicler, who is unwarily enlisting the feelings of the reader in favor of the hapless warrior whom he reviles. Philip, he says, like a savage wild beast, having been hunted by the English forces through the woods above a hundred miles backward and forward, at last was driven to his own den upon Mount Hope, where he retired, with a few of his best friends, into a swamp, which proved but a prison to keep him fast till the messengers of death came, by divine permission, to execute vengeance upon him. Even in this last refuge of desperation and despair, a sullen grandeur gathers round his memory. We picture him to ourselves, seated among his careworn followers, brooding in silence over his blasted fortunes, and acquiring a savage sublimity from the wildness and dreariness of his lurking place. Defeated, but not dismayed, crushed to the earth, but not humiliated, he seemed to grow more haughty beneath disaster, and to experience a fierce satisfaction in draining the last dregs of bitterness. Little minds are tamed and subdued by misfortune, but great minds rise above it. The very idea of submission awakened the fury of Philip, and he smote to death one of his followers who proposed an expedient of peace. 
the brother of the victim made his escape and in revenge betrayed the retreat of his chieftain a body of white men and indians were immediately dispatched to the swamp where philip lay crouched glaring with fury and despair before he was aware of their approach they had begun to surround him in a little while he saw five of his trustiest followers laid dead at his feet. All resistance was vain. He rushed forward from his covert and made a headlong attempt to escape, but was shot through the heart by renegado Indian of his own nation. Such is the scanty story of the brave but unfortunate King Philip, persecuted while living, slandered and dishonored when dead if however we consider even the prejudiced anecdotes furnished us by his enemies we may perceive in them traces of amiable and lofty character sufficient to awaken sympathy for his fate and respect for his memory we find that amidst all the harassing cares and ferocious passions of constant war he was alive to the softer feelings of connubial love and paternal tenderness and to the generous sentiment of friendship the captivity of his beloved wife and only son are mentioned with exultation as causing him poignant misery the death of any near friend is triumphantly recorded as a new blow on his sensibilities but the treachery and desertion of many of his followers in whose affections he had confided is said to have desolated his heart and to have bereaved him of all further comfort he was a patriot attached to his native soil a prince true to his subjects and indignant of their wrongs a soldier daring in battle firm in adversity patient of fatigue of hunger of every variety of bodily suffering and ready to perish in the cause he had espoused proud of heart and with an untamable love of natural liberty he preferred to enjoy it among the beasts of the forests or in the dismal and famished recesses of swamps and morasses rather than bow his haughty spirit to submission and live dependent and despised in the ease and luxury of the settlements with heroic qualities and bold achievements that would have graced a civilized warrior and have rendered him the theme of the poet and the historian he lived a wanderer and a fugitive in his native land and went down like a lonely bark foundering amid darkness and tempest without a pitying eye to weep his fall or a friendly hand to record his struggle. End of section twenty nine. Recording by L. D. Hamilton. Of the Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, Gentleman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, Gentleman, by Washington Irving. John Bull. An old song made by an aged old plate of an old worshipful gentleman who had a great estate that kept a brave old house at a bountiful rate and an old porter to relieve the poor at his gate. With an old study filled full of learned old books, with an old reverend chaplain, you might know him by his looks, with an old buttery hatch worn quite off the hooks, and an old kitchen that maintained half a dozen old cooks, like an old courtier, etc. Old Song There is no species of humour in which the English more excel than that which consists in caricaturing and giving ludicrous appellations or nicknames. In this way they have whimsically designated not merely individuals, but nations, and in their fondness for pushing a joke they have not spared even themselves. One would think that, in personifying itself, 
a nation would be apt to picture something grand, heroic, and imposing. But it is characteristic of the peculiar humour of the English, and of their love for what is blunt, comic, and familiar, that they have embodied their national oddities in the figure of a sturdy, corpulent old fellow, with a three-cornered hat, red waistcoat, leather breeches, and stout oaken cudgel. Thus they have taken a singular delight in exhibiting their most private foibles in a laughable point of view, and have been so successful in their delineations that there is scarcely a being in actual existence more absolutely present to the public mind than that eccentric personage, John Bull. Perhaps the continual contemplation of the character thus drawn of them has contributed to fix it upon the nation, and thus to give reality to what at first may have been painted in a great measure from the imagination. Men are apt to acquire peculiarities that are continually ascribed to them. The common orders of English seem wonderfully captivated with the beau ideal which they have formed of John Bull, and endeavour to act up to the broad caricature that is perpetually before their eyes. Unluckily, they sometimes make their boasted bullism an apology for their prejudice or grossness, and this I have especially noticed among those truly home-bred and genuine sons of the soil, who have never migrated beyond the sound of bow-bells. If one of these should be a little uncouth in speech, and apt to utter impertinent truths, he confesses that he is a real John Bull, and always speaks his mind. If he now and then flies into an unreasonable burst of passion about trifles, he observes that John Bull is a choleric old blade, but then his passion is over in a moment, and he bears no malice. If he betrays a coarseness of taste and insensibility to foreign refinements, he thanks heaven for his ignorance. He is a plain John Bull, and has no relish for frippery and knick-knacks. His very proneness to be gulled by strangers and to pay extravagantly for absurdities is excused under the plea of munificence, for John is always more generous than wise. Thus, under the name of John Bull, he will contrive to argue every fault into a merit, and will frankly convict himself of being the honestest fellow in existence. However little, therefore, the character may have suited in the first instance, it has gradually adapted itself to the nation, or rather they have adapted themselves to each other, and a stranger who wishes to study English peculiarities may gather much valuable information from the innumerable portraits of John Bull as exhibited in the windows of the caricature shops. Still, however, he is one of those fertile humorists that are continually throwing out new portraits and presenting different aspects from different points of view. And, often as he has been described, I cannot resist the temptation to give a slight sketch of him such as he has met my eye. John Bull, to all appearance, is a plain, downright, matter-of-fact fellow, with much less of poetry about him than rich prose. There is little of romance in his nature, but a vast deal of strong, natural feeling. He excels in humour more than in wit, is jolly rather than gay, melancholy rather than morose, can easily be moved to a sudden tear, or surprised into a broad laugh, but he loathes sentiment, and has no turn for light pleasantry. He is a boon companion, if you allow him in to have his humour, and to talk about himself, and he will stand by a friend in a quarrel with life and purse, however soundly he may be cudgelled. In this last respect, to tell the truth, he has a propensity to be somewhat too ready. He is a busy-minded personage, who thinks not merely for himself and family, but for all the country around, and is most generously disposed to be everybody's champion. He is continually volunteering his services to settle his neighbours' affairs, and takes it in great dudgeon if they engage in any matter of consequence without asking his advice, though he seldom engages in any friendly office of the kind without finishing by getting into a squabble with all parties, and then railing bitterly at their ingratitude. He unluckily took lessons in his youth in the noble science of defence, and having accomplished himself in the use of his limbs and his weapons, and become a perfect master at boxing and cudgel-play, he has had a troublesome life of it ever since. He cannot hear of a quarrel between the most distant of his neighbours, but he begins incontinently to fumble with the head of his cudgel, and consider whether his interest or honour does not require that he should meddle in the broil. Indeed, he has extended his relations of pride and policy so completely over the whole country, 
that no event can take place without infringing some of his finely spun rights and dignities. Couched in his little domain, with these filaments stretching forth in every direction, he is like some choleric, bottle-bellied old spider, who has woven his web over a whole chamber, so that a fly cannot buzz nor a breeze blow without startling his repose and causing him to sally forth wrathfully from his den. Though really a good-hearted, good-tempered old fellow at bottom, yet he is singularly fond of being in the midst of contention. It is one of his peculiarities, however, that he only relishes the beginning of an affray. He always goes into a fight with alacrity, but comes out of it grumbling even when victorious, and though no one fights with more obstinacy to carry a contested point, yet when the battle is over and he comes to the reconciliation, he is so much taken up with the mere shaking of hands that he is apt to let his antagonist pocket all that they have been quarrelling about. It is not, therefore, fighting that he ought so much to be on his guard against as making friends. It is difficult to cudgel him out of a farthing, but put him in a good humour and you may bargain him out of all the money in his pocket. He is like a stout ship which will weather the roughest storm uninjured, but roll its masts overboard in the succeeding calm. He is a little fond of playing the Magnifico abroad, of pulling out a long purse, flinging his money bravely about at boxing matches, horse races, cockfights, and carrying a high head among gentlemen of the fancy. But immediately after one of these fits of extravagance, he will be taken with violent qualms of economy, stop short at the most trivial expenditure, talk desperately of being ruined and brought upon the parish, and in such moods will not pay the smallest tradesman's bill without violent altercation. He is, in fact, the most punctual and discontented paymaster in the world, drawing his coin out of his breeches pocket with infinite reluctance, paying to the uttermost farthing, but accompanying every guinea with a growl. With all his talk of economy, however, he is a bountiful provider and a hospitable housekeeper. His economy is of a whimsical kind, its chief object being to devise how he may afford to be extravagant, for he will begrudge himself a beefsteak and a pint of port one day that he may roast an ox whole, broach a hogshead of ale, and treat all his neighbours on the next. His domestic establishment is enormously expensive, not so much from any great outward parade as from the great consumption of solid beef and pudding, the vast number of followers he feeds and clothes, and his singular disposition to pay hugely for small services. He is a most kind and indulgent master, and, provided his servants humour his peculiarities, flatter his vanity a little now and then, and do not peculate grossly on him before his face, they may manage him to perfection. Everything that lives on him seems to thrive and grow fat. His house-servants are well paid and pampered and have little to do. His horses are sleek and lazy and prance slowly before his state carriage and his house-dogs sleep quietly about the door and will hardly bark at a housebreaker. His family mansion is an old castellated manor-house, grey with age, and of a most venerable though weather-beaten appearance. It has been built upon no regular plan, but is a vast accumulation of parts erected in various tastes and ages. The centre bears evident traces of Saxon architecture and is as solid as ponderous stone and old English oak can make it. Like all the relics of that style, it is full of obscure passages, intricate mazes, and dusty chambers, and, though these have been partially lighted up in modern days, yet there are many places where you must still grope in the dark. Additions have been made to the original edifice from time to time, and great alterations have taken place, Towers and battlements have been erected during wars and tumults, wings built in time of peace, and outhouses, lodges, and offices run up according to the whim or convenience of different generations, until it has become one of the most spacious, rambling tenements imaginable. An entire wing is taken up with the family chapel, a reverend pile that must have been exceedingly sumptuous, and indeed, in spite of having been altered and simplified at various periods, has still a look of solemn religious pomp. Its walls within are storied with the monuments of John's ancestors, and it is snugly fitted up with soft cushions and well-lined chairs, 
where such of his family as are inclined to church services may doze comfortably in the discharge of their duties. To keep up this chapel has cost John much money, but he is staunch in his religion and piqued in his zeal from the circumstance that many dissenting chapels have been erected in his vicinity, and several of his neighbours, with whom he has had quarrels, are strong papists. To do the duties of the chapel he maintains, at a large expense, a pious and portly family chaplain. He is a most learned and decorous personage, and a truly well-bred Christian, who always backs the old gentleman in his opinions, winks discreetly at his little peccadilloes, rebukes the children when refractory, and is of great use in exhorting the tenants to read their Bibles, say their prayers, and, above all, to pay their rents punctually and without grumbling. The family apartments are in a very antiquated taste, somewhat heavy and often inconvenient, but full of the solemn magnificence of former times, fitted up with rich though faded tapestry, unwieldy furniture, and loads of massy, gorgeous old plate. The vast fireplaces, ample kitchens, extensive cellars, and sumptuous banqueting halls all speak of the roaring hospitality of days of yore, of which the modern festivity at the manor-house is but a shadow. There are, however, complete suites of rooms apparently deserted and time-worn, and towers and turrets that are tottering to decay, so that in high winds there is danger of their tumbling about the years of the household. John has frequently been advised to have the old edifice thoroughly overhauled, and to have some of the useless parts pulled down, and the others strengthened with their materials, but the old gentleman always grows testy on this subject. He swears the house is an excellent house, that it is tight and weather-proof, and not to be shaken by tempests, that it has stood for several hundred years, and therefore is not likely to tumble down now, that, as to its being inconvenient, his family is accustomed to the inconveniences, and would not be comfortable without them, that, as to its unwieldy size and irregular construction, these result from its being the growth of centuries, and being improved by the wisdom of every generation, that an old family like his requires a large house to dwell in. New upstart families may live in modern cottages and snug boxes, but an old English family should inhabit an old English manor-house. If you point out any part of the building as superfluous, he insists that it is material to the strength or decoration of the rest, and the harmony of the whole and swears that the parts are so built into each other that if you pull down one, you run the risk of having the whole about your ears. The secret of the matter is that John has a great disposition to protect and patronize. He thinks it indispensable to the dignity of an ancient and honorable family to be bounteous in its appointments, and to be eaten up by dependents, and so, partly from pride and partly from kind-heartedness, he makes it a rule always to give shelter and maintenance to his superannuated servants. The consequence is that, like many other venerable family establishments, his manner is encumbered by old retainers whom he cannot turn off, and an old style which he cannot lay down. His mansion is like a great hospital of invalids, and, with all its magnitude, is not a whit too large for its inhabitants. Not a nook or corner but is of use in housing some useless personage. Groups of veteran beef-eaters, gouty pensioners, and retired heroes of the buttery and the larder are seen lolling about its ways, crawling over its lawns, dozing under its tree, or sunning themselves upon the benches at its doors. Every office and outhouse is garrisoned by these supernumeraries and their families, for they are amazingly prolific, and when they die off are sure to leave John a legacy of hungry mouths to be provided for. A mattock cannot be struck against the most mouldering tumble-down tower, but out pops, from some cranny or loophole, the grey pate of some superannuated hanger-on, who has lived at John's expense all his life, and makes the most grievous outcry at their pulling down the roof from over the head of a worn-out servant of the family. This is an appeal that John's honest heart never can withstand so that a man who has faithfully eaten his beef and pudding all his life is sure to be rewarded with a pipe and tankard in his old days. A great part of his park also is turned into paddocks, where his broken-down chargers are turned loose to graze undisturbed for the remainder of their existences, a worthy example of grateful recollection which, 
if some of his neighbours were to imitate, would not be to their discredit. Indeed, it is one of his great pleasures to point out these old steeds to his visitors, to dwell on their good qualities, extol their past services, and boast, with some little vainglory, of the perilous adventures and hardy exploits through which they have carried him. He is given, however, to indulge his veneration for family usages and family encumbrances to a whimsical extent. His manner is infested by gangs of gypsies, yet he will not suffer them to be driven off, because they have infested the place time out of mind and been regular poachers upon every generation of the family. He will scarcely permit a dry branch to be lopped from the great trees that surround the house, lest it should molest the rooks that have bred there for centuries. Owls have taken possession of the dovecote, but they are hereditary owls, and must not be disturbed. Swallows have nearly choked up every chimney with their nests. Martins build in every frieze and corners. Crows flutter about the towers and perch on every weathercock. And old, grey-headed rats may be seen in every quarter of the house, running in and out of their holes undauntedly in broad daylight. In short, John has such a reverence for everything that has been long in the family that he will not hear even of abuses being reformed, because they are good old family abuses. All these whims and habits have concurred woefully to drain the old gentleman's purse, and as he prides himself on punctuality in money matters, and wishes to maintain his credit in the neighbourhood, they have caused him great perplexity in meeting his engagements. This, too, has been increased by the altercations and heart-burnings which are continually taking place in his family. His children have been brought up to different callings and are of different ways of thinking and as they have always been allowed to speak their minds freely, they do not fail to exercise the privilege most clamorously in the present posture of his affairs. Some stand up for the honour of the race, and are clear that the old establishment should be kept up in all its state, whatever may be the cost. Others, who are more prudent and considerate, entreat the old gentleman to retrench his expenses, and to put his whole system of housekeeping on a more moderate footing. He has, indeed, at times, seemed inclined to listen to their opinions, but their wholesome advice has been completely defeated by the obstreperous conduct of one of his sons. This is a noisy, rattle-pated fellow of rather low habits, who neglects his business to frequent alehouses, is the orator of village clubs, and a complete oracle among the poorest of his father's tenants. No sooner does he hear any of his brothers mention reform or retrenchment than up he jumps takes the words out of their mouths, and roars out for an overturn. When his tongue is once going, nothing can stop it. He rants about the room, hectors the old man about his spendthrift practices, ridicules his tastes and pursuits, insists that he shall turn the old servants out of doors, give the broken-down horses to the hounds, send the fat chaplain packing, and take a field preacher in his place. Nay, that the whole family mansion shall be levelled with the ground, and a plain one of brick and mortar built in its place. He rails at every social entertainment and family festivity, and skulks away growling to the alehouse whenever an equipage drives up to the door. Though constantly complaining of the emptiness of his purse, yet he scruples not to spend all his pocket-money in these tavern convocations, and even runs up scores for the liquor over which he preaches about his father's extravagance. It may readily be imagined how little such thwarting agrees with the old cavalier's fiery temperament. He has become so irritable from repeated crossings that the mere mention of retrenchment or reform is a signal for a brawl between him and the tavern oracle. As the latter is too sturdy and refractory for paternal discipline, having grown out of all fear of the cudgel, they have frequent scenes of wordy warfare which at times run so high that John is fain to call in the aid of his son Tom, an officer who has served abroad, but is at present living at home on half pay. This last is sure to stand by, the old gentleman, right or wrong, likes nothing so much as a rocketing, roistering life, and is ready at a wink or nod to out-sabre and flourish it over the orator's head if he dares to array himself against parental authority. These family dissensions, as usual, have got abroad, and are rare food for scandal in John's neighbourhood. People begin to look wise and shake their heads whenever his affairs are mentioned. They all hope that matters are not so bad with him as represented. But when a man's own children begin to rail at his extravagance, things must be badly managed. 
They understand he is mortgaged over head and ears, and is continually dabbling with money-lenders. He is certainly an open-handed old gentleman, but they fear he has lived too fast. Indeed, they never knew any good come of this fondness for hunting, racing, revelling, and prize-fighting. In short, Mr. Bull's estate is a very fine one, and has been in the family a long while. But for all that, they have known many finer estates come to the hammer." What is worst of all is the effect which these pecuniary embarrassments and domestic feuds have had on the poor man himself. Instead of that jolly round corporation and smug rosy face which he used to present, he has of late become as shriveled and shrunk as a frost-bitten apple. His scarlet gold-laced waistcoat, which bellied out so bravely in those prosperous days when he sailed before the wind, now hangs loosely about him like a mainsail in a calm. His leather breeches are all in folds and wrinkles, and apparently have much ado to hold up the boots that yawn on both sides of his once sturdy legs. Instead of strutting about as formerly, with his three-cornered head on one side, flourishing his cudgel, and bringing it down every moment with a hearty thump upon the ground, looking every one sturdily in the face, and trolling out a stave of, of a catch or a drinking song, he now goes about whistling thoughtfully to himself, with his head drooping down his cudgel tucked under his arm, and his hands thrust to the bottom of his breeches' pockets, which are evidently empty. Such is the plight of honest John Bull at present. Yet for all this, the old fellow's spirit is as tall and as gallant as ever. If you drop the least expression of sympathy or concern, he takes fire in an instant, swears that he is the richest and stoutest fellow in the country, talks of laying out large sums to adorn his house or buy another estate and with a valiant swagger and grasping of his cudgel, longs exceedingly to have another bout at quarterstaff. Though there may be something rather whimsical in all this, yet I confess that I cannot look upon John's situation without strong feelings of interest. With all his odd humours and obstinate prejudices, he is a sterling-hearted old blade. He may not be so wonderfully fine a fellow as he thinks himself, but he is at least twice as good as his neighbours represent him. His virtues are all his own, all plain, home-bred, and unaffected. His very faults smack of the raciness of his good qualities. His extravagance savours of his generosity, his quarrelsomeness of his courage, his credulity of his open faith, his vanity of his pride, and his bluntness of his sincerity. They are all the redundancies of a rich and liberal character. He is like his own oak, rough without, but sound and solid within, whose bark abounds with excrescences in proportion to the growth and grandeur of the timber, and whose branches make a fearful groaning and murmuring in the least storm from their very magnitude and luxuriance. There is something, too, in the appearance of his old family mansion that is extremely poetical and picturesque, and as long as it can be rendered comfortably habitable, I should almost tremble to see it meddled with during the present conflict of tastes and opinions. Some of his advisers are no doubt good architects that might be of service, but many, I fear, are mere levellers, who, when they had once got to work with their mattocks on this venerable edifice, would never stop until they had brought it to the ground, and perhaps buried themselves among the ruins. All that I wish is that John's present troubles may teach him more prudence in future." that he may cease to distress his mind about other people's affairs, that he may give up the fruitless attempt to promote the good of his neighbours and the peace and happiness of the world by dint of the cudgel, that he may remain quietly at home, gradually get his house into repair, cultivate his rich estate according to his fancy, husband his income, if he thinks proper, bring his unruly children into order, if he can, renew the jovial scenes of ancient prosperity, and long enjoy on his paternal lands a green, an honourable, and a merry old age. End of section 30。section 31 of The Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, Gentleman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marg McGrail The Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, Gentleman By Washington Irving THE PRIDE OF THE VILLAGE May no wolf howl, no screech owl stir a wing about thy sepulchre, no boisterous winds or storms come hither to starve or wither thy soft sweet earth. But, like a spring, love kept it ever flourishing. Herrick in the course of an excursion through one of the remote counties of England, I had struck into one of those crossroads that lead through the more secluded parts of the country, and stopped one afternoon at a village, the situation of which was beautifully rural and retired. There was an air of primitive simplicity about its inhabitants not to be found in the villages which lie on the great coach roads. I determined to pass the night there, and, having taken an early dinner, strolled out to enjoy the neighboring scenery. My ramble, as is usually the case with travelers, soon led me to the church, which stood at a little distance from the village. Indeed, it was an object of some curiosity, its old tower being completely overrun with ivy, so that only here and there a jutting buttress, an angle of grey wall, or a fantastically carved ornament peered through the verdant covering. It was a lovely evening. The early part of the day had been dark and showery, but in the afternoon it had cleared up, and, though sullen clouds still hung overhead, Yet there was a broad tract of golden sky in the west, from which the setting sun gleamed through the dripping leaves, and lit up all nature into a melancholy smile. It seemed like the parting hour of a good Christian smiling on the sins and sorrows of the world, and giving, in the serenity of his decline, an assurance that he will rise again in glory. I had seated myself on a half-sunken tombstone, and was musing, as one is apt to do at this sober-thoughted hour, on past scenes and early friends, on those who were distant and those who were dead, and indulging in that kind of melancholy fancying which has in it something sweeter even than pleasure. Every now and then the stroke of a bell from the neighboring tower fell on my ear. Its tones were in unison with the scene, and, instead of jarring, chimed in with my feelings. And it was some time before I recollected that it must be tolling the knell of some new tenant of the tomb. Presently I saw a funeral train moving across the village green, it wound slowly along a lane, was lost, and reappeared through the breaks of the hedges until it passed the place where I was sitting. The pall was supported by young girls dressed in white, and another, about the age of seventeen, walked before, bearing a chaplet of white flowers, a token that the deceased was a young and unmarried female. The corpse was followed by the parents. They were a venerable couple of the better order of peasantry. The father seemed to repress his feelings, but his fixed eye, contracted brow, and deeply furrowed face showed the struggle that was passing within. His wife hung on his arm and wept aloud with the convulsive bursts of a mother's sorrow. I followed the funeral into the church, the bier was placed in the center aisle, and the chaplet of white flowers with a pair of white gloves was hung over the seat which the deceased had occupied. 
every one knows the soul subduing pathos of the funeral service for who is so fortunate as never to have followed some one he has loved to the tomb but when performed over the remains of innocence and beauty thus laid low in the bloom of existence what can be more affecting at that simple but most solemn consignment of the body to the grave earth to earth ashes to ashes dust to dust the tears of the youthful companions of the deceased flowed unrestrained the father still seemed to struggle with his feelings and to comfort himself with the assurance that the dead are blessed which die in the lord but the mother only thought of her child as a flower of the field cut down and withered in the midst of its sweetness she was like rachel mourning over her children and would not be comforted on returning to the inn i learnt the whole story of the deceased it was a simple one and such as has often been told she had been the beauty and pride of the village her father had once been an opulent farmer but was reduced in circumstances this was an only child and brought up entirely at home in the simplicity of rural life she had been the pupil of the village pastor the favorite lamb of his little flock the good man watched over her education with paternal care it was limited and suitable to the sphere in which she was to move for he only sought to make her an ornament to her station in life not to raise her above it the tenderness and indulgence of her parents and the exemption from all ordinary occupations had fostered a natural grace and delicacy of character that accorded with the fragile loveliness of her form she appeared like some tender plant of the garden blooming accidentally amid the hardier natives of the fields the superiority of her charms was felt and acknowledged by her companions but without envy for it was surpassed by the unassuming gentleness and winning kindness of her manners it might be truly said of her this is the prettiest low-born lass that ever ran on the green sward nothing she does or seems but smacks of something greater than herself too noble for this place the village was one of those sequestered spots which still retained some vestiges of old english customs it had its rural festivals and holiday pastimes and still kept up some faint observance of the once popular rites of may these indeed had been promoted by its present pastor who was a lover of old customs and one of those simple christians that think their mission fulfilled by promoting joy on earth and good will among mankind under his auspices the maypole stood from year to year in the centre of the village green on may day it was decorated with garlands and streamers and a queen or lady of the may was appointed as in former times to preside at the sports and distribute the prizes and rewards the picturesque situation of the village and the fancifulness of its rustic fights would often attract the notice of casual visitors among these on one may day was a young officer whose regiment had been recently quartered in the neighborhood he was charmed with the native taste that pervaded this village pageant but above all with the dawning loveliness of the queen of may it was the village favorite who was crowned with flowers and blushing and smiling in all the beautiful confusion of girlish diffidence and delight the artlessness of rural habits enabled him readily to make her acquaintance he gradually won his way into her intimacy 
and paid his court to her in that unthinking way in which young officers are too apt to trifle with rustic simplicity. There was nothing in his advances to startle or alarm. He never even talked of love. But there are modes of making it more eloquent than language, and which convey it subtly and irresistibly to the heart. The beam of the eye, the tone of voice, the thousand tendernesses which emanate from every word and look and action, these form the true eloquence of love, and can always be felt and understood, but never described. Can we wonder that they should readily win a heart young, guileless, and susceptible? As to her, she loved almost unconsciously. She scarcely inquired what was the growing passion that was absorbing every thought and feeling, or what were to be its consequences. She, indeed, looked not to the future. When present, his looks and words occupied her whole attention. When absent, she thought but of what had passed at their recent interview. She would wander with him through the green lanes and rural scenes of the vicinity. He taught her to see new beauties in nature. He talked in the language of polite and cultivated life and breathed into her ear the witcheries of romance and poetry. Perhaps there could not have been a passion between the sexes more pure than this innocent girl's. The gallant figure of her youthful admirer and the splendor of his military attire might at first have charmed her eye, but it was not these that had captivated her heart. Her attachment had something in it of idolatry. She looked up to him as to a being of a superior order. She felt in his society the enthusiasm of a mind naturally delicate and poetical, and now first awakened to a keen perception of the beautiful and grand. Of the sordid distinctions of rank and fortune she thought nothing. It was the difference of intellect, of demeanor, of manners, from those of the rustic society to which she had been accustomed, that elevated him in her opinion. She would listen to him with charmed ear and downcast look of mute delight, and her cheek would mantle with enthusiasm or if ever she ventured a shy glance of timid admiration, it was as quickly withdrawn, and she would sigh and blush at the idea of her comparative unworthiness. Her lover was equally impassioned, but his passion was mingled with feelings of a coarser nature. He had begun the connection in levity, for he had often heard his brother officers boast of their village conquests, and thought some triumph of the kind necessary to his reputation as a man of spirit. But he was too full of youthful fervor. His heart had not yet been rendered sufficiently cold and selfish by a wandering and dissipated life. It caught fire from the very flame it sought to kindle, and before he was aware of the nature of his situation, he became really in love. What was he to do? There were the old obstacles which so incessantly occur in these heedless attachments. His rank in life, the prejudices of titled connections, his dependence upon a proud and unyielding father, all forbade him to think of matrimony. But when he looked down upon this innocent being, so tender and confiding, there was a purity in her manners, a blamelessness in her life, 
and a beseeching modesty in her looks that awed down every licentious feeling. In vain did he try to fortify himself by a thousand heartless examples of men of fashion, and to chill the glow of generous sentiment with that cold derisive levity with which he had heard them talk of female virtue. Whenever he came into her presence, she was still surrounded by that mysterious but impassive charm of virgin purity in whose hallowed sphere no guilty thought can live. The sudden arrival of orders from the regiment to repair to the continent completed the confusion of his mind. He remained for a short time in a state of the most painful irresolution. He hesitated to communicate the tidings until the day for marching was at hand, when he gave her the intelligence in the course of an evening ramble. The idea of parting had never before occurred to her. It broke in at once upon her dream of felicity. She looked upon it as a sudden and insurmountable evil, and wept with the guileless simplicity of a child. He drew her to his bosom and kissed the tears from her soft cheek, nor did he meet with a repulse, for there are moments of mingled sorrow and tenderness which hallow the caresses of affection. He was naturally impetuous, and the sight of beauty apparently yielding in his arms, the confidence of his power over her, and the dread of losing her forever, all conspired to overwhelm his better feelings. He ventured to propose that she should leave her home and be the companion of his fortunes. He was quite a novice in seduction, and blushed and faltered at his own baseness, but so innocent of mind was his intended victim that she was at first at a loss to comprehend his meaning and why she should leave her native village and the humble roof of her parents. When at last the nature of his proposal flashed upon her pure mind, the effect was withering. She did not weep, she did not break forth into reproach. She said not a word, but she shrunk back aghast as from a viper, gave him a look of anguish that pierced to his very soul, and, clasping her hands in agony, fled, as if for refuge, to her father's cottage. The officer retired, confounded, humiliated, and repentant. It is uncertain what might have been the result of the conflict of his feelings, had not his thoughts been diverted by the bustle of departure. New scenes, new pleasures, and new companions soon dissipated his self-reproach and stifled his tenderness. Yet, amidst the stir of camps, the revelries of garrisons, the array of armies, and even the din of battles, his thoughts would sometimes steal back to the scenes of rural quiet and village simplicity the white cottage, the footpath along the silver brook and up the hawthorn edge, and the little village maid loitering along it, leaning on his arm and listening to him with eyes beaming with unconscious affection. The shock which the poor girl had received in the destruction of all her ideal world had indeed been cruel. Faintings and hysterics had at first shaken her tender frame, and were succeeded by a settled and pining melancholy. She had beheld from her window the march of the departing troops. She had seen her faithless lover borne off as if in triumph amidst the sound of drum and trumpet and the pomp of arms. She strained a last aching gaze after him as the morning sun glittered about his figure and his plume waved in the breeze. 
he passed away like a bright vision from her sight, and left her all in darkness. It would be trite to dwell on the particulars of her after-story. It was, like other tales of love, melancholy. She avoided society and wandered out alone in the walks she had most frequented with her lover. She sought, like the stricken deer, to weep in silence and loneliness and brood over the barbed sorrow that rankled in her soul. Sometimes she would be seen late of an evening sitting in the porch of the village church, and the milkmaids returning from the fields would now and then overhear her singing some plaintive ditty in the hawthorn walk. She became fervent in her devotions at church, and as the old people saw her approach so wasted away, yet with a hectic gloom and that hallowed air which melancholy diffuses round the form, they would make way for her as for something spiritual, and looking after her would shake their heads in gloomy foreboding. She felt a conviction that she was hastening to the tomb, but looked forward to it as a place of rest. The silver cord that had bound her to existence was loosed, and there seemed to be no more pleasure under the sun. If ever her gentle bosom had entertained resentment against her lover, it was extinguished. She was incapable of angry passions, and in a moment of saddened tenderness she penned him a farewell letter. It was couched in the simplest language, but touching from its very simplicity. She told him that she was dying, and did not conceal from him that his conduct was the cause. She even depicted the sufferings which she had experienced, but concluded with saying that she could not die in peace until she had sent him her forgiveness, and her blessing. By degrees her strength declined that she could no longer leave the cottage. She could only totter to the window, where, propped up in her chair, it was her enjoyment to sit all day and look out upon the landscape. Still she uttered no complaint nor imparted to any one the malady that was preying on her heart. She never even mentioned her lover's name, but would lay her head on her mother's bosom and weep in silence. Her poor parents hung in mute anxiety over this fading blossom of their hopes, still flattering themselves that it might again revive to freshness and that the bright unearthly bloom which sometimes flushed her cheek might be the promise of returning health. In this way she was seated between them one Sunday afternoon. Her hands were clasped in theirs. The lattice was thrown open, and the soft air that stole in brought with it the fragrance of the clustering honeysuckle which her own hands had trained round the window. Her father had just been reading a chapter in the Bible. It spoke of the vanity of worldly things and of the joys of heaven. It seemed to have diffused comfort and serenity through her bosom. Her eye was fixed on the distant village church. The bell had tolled for the evening service. The last villager was lagging into the porch and everything had sunk into that hallowed stillness peculiar to the day of rest. Her parents were gazing on her with yearning hearts. Sickness and sorrow, which passed so roughly over some faces, had given to hers the expression of a seraph's. A tear trembled in her soft blue eye, was she thinking of her faithless lover? 
or were her thoughts wandering to that distant churchyard into whose bosom she might soon be gathered suddenly the clang of hoofs was heard a horseman galloped to the cottage he dismounted before the window the poor girl gave a faint exclamation and sunk back in her chair it was her repentant lover he rushed into the house and flew to clasp her to his bosom but her wasted form her death-like countenance so wan yet so lovely in its desolation smote him to the soul and he threw himself in agony at her feet she was too faint to rise she attempted to extend her trembling hand her lips moved as if she spoke but no word was articulated she looked down upon him with a smile of unutterable tenderness and closed her eyes forever such are the particulars which i gathered of this village story they are but scanty and i am conscious have little novelty to recommend them in the present rage also for strange incident and high seasoned narrative they may appear trite and insignificant but they interested me strongly at the time and taken in connection with the affecting ceremony which i had just witnessed left a deeper impression on my mind than many circumstances of a more striking nature i have passed through the place since and visited the church again from a better motive than mere curiosity it was a wintry evening the trees were stripped of their foliage the churchyard looked naked and mournful and the wind rustled coldly through the dry grass evergreens however had been planted about the grave of the village favorite and osiers were bent over it to keep the turf uninjured the church door was open and i stepped in there hung the chaplet of flowers and the gloves as on the day of the funeral the flowers were withered it is true but care seemed to have been taken that no dust should soil their whiteness i have seen many monuments where art has exhausted its powers to awaken the sympathy of the spectator but i have met with none that spoke more touchingly to my heart than this simple but delicate memento of departed innocence and of section 31 recording by marg mcgrail of the sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, gentlemen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Howard. The Sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, gentlemen, by Washington Irving. The Angler. Quote, this day Dame Nature seemed in love the lusty sap began to move fresh juice did stir the embracing vines and birds had drawn their valentines the jealous trout that low did lie rose at a well-dissembled fly there stood my friend with patient skill attending of his trembling quill Unquote. sir h watton it is said that many an unlucky urchin is induced to run away from his family and betake himself to a seafaring life from reading the history of robinson crusoe and i suspect that in like manner many of those worthy gentlemen who are given to haunt the sides of pastoral streams with angle rods in hand may trace the origin of their passion to the seductive pages of honest isaac walton i recollect studying his complete angler 
several years since in company with a knot of friends in America, and moreover that we were all completely bitten with the angling mania. It was early in the year, but as soon as the weather was auspicious and that the spring began to melt into the verge of summer, we took rod in hand and sallied into the country as stark mad as was ever Don Quixote from reading books of chivalry. One of our party had equaled the Don in the fullness of his equipments, being attired cap a pie for the enterprise. He wore a broad-skirted fustian coat perplexed with half a hundred pockets, a pair of stout shoes and leathern gaiters, a basket slung on one side for fish, a patent rod, a landing net, and a score of other inconveniences only to be found in the true angler's armory. Thus harnessed for the field, he was as great a matter of stare and wonderment among the country folk, who had never seen a regular angler, as was the steel-clad hero of La Mancha among the goat herds of the Sierra Morena. Our first essay was along a mountain brook among the highlands of the Hudson, a most unfortunate place for the execution of those piscatory tactics which had been invented along the velvet margins of quiet English rivulets. It was one of those wild streams that lavish, among our romantic solitudes, unheeded beauties enough to fill the sketchbook of a hunter of the picturesque. Sometimes it would leap down rocky shelves, making small cascades over which the trees threw their broad balancing sprays and long nameless weeds hung in fringes from the impending banks, dripping with diamond drops. Sometimes it would brawl and fret along a ravine in the matted shade of a forest, filling it with murmurs, and after this ptarmigant career would steal forth into open day with the most placid, demure face imaginable, as I have seen some pestilent shrew of a housewife, after filling her home with uproar and ill-humor, come dimpling out of doors, swimming and curtsying and smiling upon all the world. How smoothly would this vagrant brook glide at such times through some bosom of green meadowland among the mountains, where the quiet was only interrupted by the occasional tinkling of a bell from the lazy cattle among the clover, or the sound of a woodcutter's axe from the neighboring forest. For my part, I was always a bungler at all kinds of sport that required either patience or adroitness, and had not angled above half an hour before I had completely satisfied the sentiment and convinced myself of the truth of Isaac Walton's opinion that angling is something like poetry, a man must be born to it. I hooked myself instead of the fish, tangled my line in every tree, lost my bait, broke my rod, until I gave up the attempt in despair, and passed the day under the trees reading old Isaac, satisfied that it was his fascinating vein of honest simplicity and rural feeling that had bewitched me, and not the passion for angling. My companions, however, were more persevering in their delusion. I have them at this moment before my eyes, stealing along the border of the brook where it lay open to the day or was merely fringed by shrubs and bushes. I see the bittern rising with hollow scream as they break in upon his rarely invaded haunt, the kingfisher watching them suspiciously from his dry tree that overhangs the deep black mill pond in the gorge of the hills the tortoise letting himself slip sideways from off the stone or log on which he is sunning himself, and the panic-struck frog plumping in headlong as they approach and spreading an alarm throughout the watery world around. I recollect also that after toiling and watching and creeping about for the greater part of a day, with scarcely any success in spite of all our admirable apparatus, a lubberly country urchin came down from the hills with a rod made from a branch of a tree, a few yards of twine, and, as heaven shall help me, I believe, a crooked pin for a hook, baited with a vile earthworm, and in half an hour caught more fish than we had nibbles throughout the day. But above all, I recollect the good, honest, wholesome, hungry repast which we made under a beech tree just by a spring of pure sweet water that stole out of the side of a hill and how, when it was over, one of the party read old Isaac Walton's scene with the milkmaid, while I lay on the grass and built castles in a bright pile of clouds until I fell asleep. All this may appear like mere egotism, yet I cannot refrain from uttering these recollections, which are passing like a strain of music over my mind, and have been called up by an agreeable scene which I witnessed not long since. 
In the morning's stroll along the banks of the Allen, a beautiful little stream which flows down from the Welsh hills and throws itself into the Dee, my attention was attracted to a group seated on the margin. On approaching, I found it to consist of a veteran angler and two rustic disciples. The former was an old fellow with a wooden leg, with clothes very much but very carefully patched, betokening poverty honestly come by and decently maintained. His face bore the marks of former storms, but present fair weather, its furrows had been worn into a habitual smile, his iron-gray locks hung about his ears, and he had altogether the good-humored air of a constitutional philosopher who was disposed to take the world as it went. One of his companions was a ragged white with the skulking look of an errant poacher, and all warrant could find his way to any gentleman's fish-pond in the neighborhood in the darkest night. The other was a tall, awkward country lad, with a lounging gait and apparently somewhat of a rustic bow. The old man was busy in examining the maw of a trout which he had just killed to discover by its contents what insects were seasonable for bait, and was lecturing on the subject to his companions, who appeared to listen with infinite deference. I have a kind feeling toward all brothers of the angle ever since I read Isaac Walton. They are men, he affirms, of a mild, sweet, and peaceable spirit, and my esteem for them has been increased since I met with an old treatise of fishing with the angle in which are set forth many of the maxims of their inoffensive fraternity. Take good heed, saith this honest little treatise, that in going about your disports ye open no man's gates, but that ye shut them again. Also ye shall not use this foresaid crafty desport for no covetousness to the increasing and sparing of your money only, but principally for your solace and to cause the health of your body and specially of your soul. Note. From this same treatise, it would appear that angling is a more industrious and devout employment than it is generally considered. For when ye purpose to go on your disports in fishing, ye will not desire greatly many persons with you which might let you off your game, and that you may serve God devoutly in saying effectually your customable prayers, and thus doing, ye shall eschew and also avoid many vices, as idleness, which is principal cause to induce man to many other vices, as it is right well known. I thought that I could perceive in the veteran angler before me an exemplification of what I had read, and there was a cheerful contentedness in his looks that quite drew me toward him. I could not but remark the gallant manner in which he stumped from one part of the brook to another, waving his rod in the air to keep the line from dragging on the ground or catching among the bushes, and the adroitness with which he would throw his fly to any particular place, sometimes skimming it lightly along a little rapid, sometimes casting it into one of those dark holes made by a twisted root or overhanging bank in which the large trout are apt to lurk. In the meanwhile he was giving instructions to his two disciples, showing them the manner in which they should handle their rods, fix their flies, and play them along the surface of the stream. The scene brought to my mind the instructions of the sage Piscator to his scholar. The country around was of that pastoral kind which Walton is fond of describing. It was a part of the great plain of Cheshire, close by the beautiful vale of Gesford, and just where the inferior Welsh hills begin to swell up from among fresh-smelling meadows. The day, too, like that recorded in his work, was mild and sunshiny, with now and then a soft dropping shower that sowed the whole earth with diamonds. I soon fell into conversation with the old angler, and was so much entertained that under pretext of receiving instructions in his art, I kept company with him almost the whole day, wandering along the banks of the stream and listening to his talk. He was very communicative, having all the easy gorality of cheerful old age, and I fancy was a little flattered by having an opportunity to display his piscatory lore, for who does not like now and then to play the sage? He had been much of a rambler in his day, and had passed some years of his youth in America, particularly in Savannah, where he had entered into trade and been ruined by the indiscretion of a partner. He had afterwards experienced many ups and downs in life, until he got into the Navy, where his leg was carried away by a cannonball at the Battle of Camperdown. This was the only stroke of real good fortune he had ever experienced, for it got him a pension, which, together with some small paternal property, brought him in a revenue of nearly forty pounds. 
On this he retired to his native village, where he lived quietly and independently, and devoted the remainder of his life to the noble art of angling. I found that he had read Isaac Walton attentively, and he seemed to have imbibed all his simple frankness and prevalent good humor. Though he had been sorely buffeted about the world, he was satisfied that the world in itself was good and beautiful. Though he had been as roughly used in different countries as a poor sheep that is fleeced by every hedge and thicket, yet he spoke of every nation with candor and kindness, appearing to look only on the good side of things, and above all, he was almost the only man I had ever met with who had been an unfortunate adventurer in America and had honesty and magnanimity enough to take the fault to his own door and not to curse the country. The lad that was receiving his instructions, I learnt, was the son and heir apparent of a fat old widow who kept the village inn, and of course a youth of some expectation and much courted by the idle gentleman-like personages of the place. In taking him under his care, therefore, the old man had probably an eye to a privileged corner in the tap-room and an occasional cup of cheerful ale free of expense. There is certainly something in angling, if we could forget which anglers are apt to do the cruelties and tortures inflicted on worms and insects, that tends to produce a gentleness of spirit and a pure serenity of mind. As the English are methodical even in their recreations and are the most scientific of sportsmen, it has been reduced among them to perfect rule and system. Indeed, it is an amusement peculiarly adapted to the mild and highly cultivated scenery of England, where every roughness has been softened away from the landscape. It is delightful to saunter along those limpid streams which wander like veins of silver through the bosom of this beautiful country, leading one through a diversity of small home scenery, sometimes winding through ornamented grounds, sometimes brimming along through rich pasturage, where the fresh green is mingled with sweet-smelling flowers, sometimes venturing in sight of villages and hamlets, and then running capriciously away into shady retirements. The sweetness and serenity of nature and the quiet watchfulness of the sport gradually bring on pleasant fits of musing, which are now and then agreeably interrupted by the song of a bird, the distant whistle of the peasant, or perhaps the vagary of some fish leaping out of the still water and skimming transiently about its glassy surface. When I would beget content, said Isaac Walton, and increase confidence in the power and wisdom and providence of Almighty God, I will walk the meadows by some gliding stream and there contemplate the lilies that take no care and those very many other little living creatures that are not only created but fed, man knows not how, by the goodness of the God of nature and therefore trust in him. I cannot forbear to give another quotation from one of those ancient champions of angling which breathes the same innocent and happy spirit. Let me live harmlessly, and near the brink of Trent or Avon have a dwelling place, where I may see my quill or cork down sink with eager bite of pike or bleak or dace, and on the world and my creator think, while some men strive ill-gotten goods to embrace and others spend their time in base excess of wine or worse in war or wantonness, let them that will these pastimes still pursue, and on such pleasing fancies feed their fill, so I the fields and meadows green may view, and daily by fresh rivers walk at will, among the daisies and the violets blue, red hyacinth and yellow daffodil. J. Davers On parting with the old angler I inquired after his place of abode, and happening to be in the neighborhood of the village a few evenings afterwards, I had the curiosity to seek him out. I found him living in a small cottage containing only one room, but a perfect curiosity in its method and arrangement. It was on the skirts of the village, on a green bank a little back from the road, with a small garden in front stocked with kitchen herbs and adorned with a few flowers. The whole front of the cottage was overrun with honeysuckle. On the top was a ship for a weathercock. The interior was fitted up in a truly nautical style, his ideas of comfort and convenience having been acquired on the berth deck of a man-of-war. A hammock was slung from the ceiling, which in the daytime was lashed up so as to take but little room. From the center of the chamber hung a model of a ship, of his own workmanship. Two or three chairs, a table, and a large sea chest formed the principal movables. About the wall were stuck-up naval ballads, such as Admiral Hosier's Ghost, all in the Downs, and Tom Bowling, intermingled with pictures of sea fights, among which the Battle of Camperdown held a distinguished place. 
The mantelpiece was decorated with seashells over which hung a quadrant flanked by two woodcuts of most bitter-looking naval commanders. His implements for angling were carefully disposed on nails and hooks about the room. On a shelf was arranged his library, containing a work on angling, much worn, a Bible covered with canvas, an odd volume or two of voyages, a nautical almanac, and a book of songs. His family consisted of a large black cat with one eye, and a parrot which he had caught and tamed and educated himself in the course of one of his voyages, and which uttered a variety of sea phrases with the hoarse brattling tone of a veteran boatswain. The establishment reminded me of that of the renowned Robinson Crusoe. It was kept in neat order, everything being stowed away with the regularity of a ship of war, and he informed me that he scoured the deck every morning and swept it between meals. I found him seated on a bench before the door, smoking his pipe in the soft evening sunshine. His cat was purring soberly on the threshold, and his parrot describing some strange evolutions in an iron ring that swung in the center of his cage. He had been angling all day and gave me a history of his sport with as much minuteness as a general would talk over a campaign, being particularly animated in relating the manner in which he had taken a large trout, which had completely tasked all his skill and wariness, and which he had sent as a trophy to mine hostess of the inn. How comforting it is to see a cheerful and contented old age, and to behold a poor fellow like this, after being tempest-tossed through life, safely moored in a snug and quiet harbor in the evening of his days. His happiness, however, sprung from within himself, and was independent of external circumstances, for he had that inexhaustible good nature which is the most precious gift of heaven, spreading itself like oil over the troubled sea of thought, and keeping the mind smooth and equable in the roughest weather. On inquiring further about him, I learnt that he was a universal favorite in the village and the oracle of the tap-room, where he delighted the rustics with his songs, and, like Sinbad, astonished them with his stories of strange lands and shipwrecks and sea-fights. He was much noticed, too, by gentlemen sportsmen of the neighborhood, had taught several of them the art of angling, and was a privileged visitor to their kitchens. The whole tenor of his life was quiet and inoffensive, being principally passed about the neighboring streams when the weather and season were favorable, and at other times he employed himself at home, preparing his fishing tackle for the next campaign, or manufacturing rods, nets, and flies for his patrons and pupils among the gentry. He was a regular attendant at church on Sundays, though he generally fell asleep during the sermon. He had made it his particular request that when he died he should be buried in a green spot which he could see from his seat in church, and which he had marked out ever since he was a boy, and had thought of when far from home on the raging sea in danger of being food for the fishes. It was the spot where his father and mother had been buried. I have done, for I fear that my reader is growing weary, but I could not refrain from drawing the picture of this worthy brother of the angle, who has made me more than ever in love with the theory, though I fear I shall never be adroit in the practice of his art. And I will conclude this rambling sketch in the words of honest Isaac Walton, by craving the blessing of St. Peter's master upon my reader, and upon all that are true lovers of virtue, and dare trust in his providence, and be quiet, and go a-angling. End of section 32. Recording by Chris Howard, Columbus, Mississippi, July 2011.